Walk with me through the cellar door. A storm is coming, Francis. A portal to a more skeptical world. Cellar Door Skeptics begins right now. Prepare for the revolution with your hosts, Christopher Tanner and Chris Hanna. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another Cellar Door Skeptics. Thank you all so much for sticking around. We're on episode 138. And, and, and I got to tell everyone, it's it's been it's been a journey. I we've we've had a long <laughs> A long run with this, and this week we have even more political news to tantalize your brains. <laughs> well, there's an election. There's the primaries tomorrow, man. Well, technically, we're recording this Monday night, so for everyone that tomorrow is, uh, we're going to be obviously putting this out tomorrow. So blah blah blah. Anyways, time travels. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but yeah. So uh, the primary is happening. His happening will happen. And uh, it's pretty exciting. I'm hoping, we're all hoping, you know, there's going to be a nice, solid turnout on all the minorities, the young people to really show this country what we uh, what we want the direction to look like in the future. And we'll see what happens, man. I can't, I'm excited. I'm super excited to, to vote tomorrow. Yeah. And I am too. And that's kind of the funny thing. You know, last week, Fred challenged everybody, um, you know, and said, hey, get out and vote, put it in your phones. And for those of you who didn't watch any of the Abdul rallies, and I guess if you have listened to this podcast for a while now, you know we're a little biased for Abdul. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, last night I'm I'm making dinner and I got it going. I got tears in my eyes. I'm crying. And then all of a sudden here comes Bernie Sanders. And then everything just started all over again. And I go, man, I really miss that old guy. God, I really miss that guy. And he goes, he, he says this, he goes, you know, there's 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 a thousand of you guys out here, right? And I'll tell you what, you know, Abdul's down in the polls. But remember what happened in Michigan last time when I was here? <laughs> Do you remember that? And then he goes, if every one of you went out and talked to three people and took three friends or three families to the polls, that would be three thousand people voting for Abdul. Yeah, and and, yeah. and just the the inspiration of that man, like it's just you just sit there and you go. Yeah, does Bernie have some flaws? Yes. Um, but I'm telling you, like the inspiration from that that gentleman is just is just off the charts. I mean, the only person that I've ever had better feelings about at a rally who's more conservative than Bernie is Barack Obama, and that yeah. dude can speak. Holy crap! And that dude raise a crowd. Well, he he sounds like the most eloquent and clearest speaker you've ever heard. When all we've been getting is the Trump speak, <laughs> I don't even know what that like. The or when people read his tweets aloud, that hurts. That hurts every bit of the English language in my body because it. I I don't like Twitter that much, anyways, because it forces you to basically skip pronunciation and punctuation and all of the things that make our language good and and, and quirky and specific, and. They gave him 256, 280 characters, whatever it is they give the president. And it's just, it hurts. It hurts so bad listening to that. And then, you, like, um, Obama came out and did some speeches and he's been stumping for people lately. It sounds like he, <laughs> it sounds like a Nobel laureate. It's unbelievable how clear and, and uh, concise and ex it, his language is. Uh, it's just a, it's a, it's an interesting uh, throwback to what we used to have. And then Bernie Sanders got his own style, yeah. But uh, I'm just hoping that um, this is another showing for what 538 said when they basically said that we missed. I I love watching 538. Their whole website ate their fedoras after Bernie beat. Hillary in Michigan, like they, they were just like, this is, we had no clue. This snuck up on us completely. And hopefully we can see that again, come through the, uh, the democratic primary season here. Yeah. And, and, and you're right. I, I, I'm excited. Will, will I vote for Gretchen? Yes. If that's what I have to do, but I'm just, yeah, me too. I'm, I'm to the point, you know, and, and how about this? This is kind of funny. Cause I was messaging, you know, friends and family tonight, right? I have two friends that I know are definitely a liberal. 
And they were like, yeah, we don't vote in the primaries. We don't care that much. We just vote for the Democrat, you know, in the general. And it's like, no, 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 <laughs> please, please go. Cause you make a difference. Oh, yeah. And we were talking, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, you know, and we were sitting around and we were, we were smoking a little bit and we were talking about, you know, how, um, they, you know, they were, they love Bernie. They thought, you know, all these ideas were great. And I was like, Hey, you know, there's a governor running that has similar ideas. Oh, and by the way, that's local. That's is our state, man. This isn't even like a national election. We're talking, we can make a difference in our state. And they're just sitting there like, yeah, well, I don't know. So I texted them tonight. One didn't respond. And I'm going to text them in the morning and be like, Hey, I'm going to be disappointed if you don't go vote. Even if you, <laughs> even, even if you don't vote for who I, who I vote for. I'm going to be disappointed. And then, you know, I'd be, you know, his, his wife or whatever. I was like, seriously, you guys, you guys say you like Bernie. Hey, go out and vote. This is, this is important here. This is important well, Bern- to get out. Well, Bernie's foundation, our revolution, they have endorsed Abul and they've, yeah. they've endorsed, there's a, there's a girl running or woman running for the uh, Kent County commissioner. Also, they've endorsed her as well. Um, Katie something I got I got her mailer upstairs it just came in the mail on Sunday I have and I, I'm definitely I, I looked up some of her stuff but she had it directly on her mailer that she is willing to fight corporate money from local politics I, uh, it's awesome like you hear about these things like Nestle coming in and buying huge chunks of of uh, mineral rights and water rights in cities like ever like this is a giant corporation coming in and just just doing whatever it wants and here's a county commissioner is basically saying no I'm not going to do that I'm not going to allow corporations to do whatever they want in, in this county and that's that's not that's a small place to start that's local politics that where the where the rubber hits the road right like the president can say I'm going to get corporations out of politics but you know who's actually going to do it? Someone at the local level who's willing to look at them in, in the face and say no. And that's what I need. So she's probably going to be the one that I go through. And I will uh, – I'll have to get her name. I'm going to share it out tomorrow um, so people can vote on our uh, Facebook page. Yeah. And and that's kind of the same thing is that, you know, like you say, is I'm going around my – you know, through the, my family. You know, people are kind of like eh, eh. And then, you know, my sister's boyfriend, right, Who who every time – I've, you know, critiqued Trump or critiqued um, how minorities are treated in this country has agreed with me, has laughed, has shared, has said, thank you know, this is this is awesome that other people are talking about it. So I I just assumed he was a he was liberal. <laughs> so I sent him a message <laughs> and I was like, hey, don't forget to go out to vote tomorrow. Hey, Abdul's running. He's very close to Bernie. He's sponsored. This is you go. The message back is I don't support Bernie. And I was like, oh my God, wait, 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 what? And I messaged him back. I was like, I was like, really? He's like, yeah. Socialists are, socialists are bad, man. They're communists. Take a guess what candidate he supported. I'm going to say Jill. No. Oh, no. Oh, no, my friend. Oh, no. No. He was ben, Carson. Johnson, ben Carson. Ben <laughs> Carson. And, and, and I was like, well, really? please go out and vote anyway. It's nice to have extra <laughs> people vote in this election. Yeah. Like, I don't know what to say to that. Like, what do you say to that? Because I just want to lambaste them and be like, I can't believe, A, I get it. You're both black. Maybe maybe there's a correlation there. But I, I, I don't understand why of all people you would pick Ben Carson. Like, he has no good qualities other than he's nice. That's it. Well, no, he, and he's ben, a doctor. Ben I guess. Carson, I guess he's nice. But. Yeah, ben Car Ben Carson is an amazing surgeon. He's a terrible housing and urban development director. He he's a horrible even, politician. He, period. He's an even yeah. He's even worse at campaigning. But I mean, I I I think what I think a lot of people is um, the African American conservative is somebody that is not as visible, but they are pretty re- pretty reliable um they're not as common but uh they're there and like i think that that's something that like they try they say that you know that the a way of bringing in that part of the uh the country into the conservative party is having someone like ben carson try to bring in the african-american vote because let's face it the democrats haven't exactly been doing as much as they could to endorse things, you know, the black lives matter and really start changing what's happening in the inner cities and the candidates that we support do. And, you know, we're trying to change the face of the democratic party. And the way you do that is through these primary elections, because if the primaries are all going to the, 
to the further left than the centrist, the party has to change. Otherwise, it, it'll just get swept up and we'll move on without it. Like the Democratic Socialist Party is hopefully could take over from the inside of the Democratic Party, much like the Tea Party pretty much gutted all of the morality in the GOP. Yeah. And that's kind of what I said to him. I was like, I don't under I don't understand your choice. It's your choice. And hey, more power to you. I'll be happy to have a conversation about why I feel every GOP position is immoral. <laughs> like, I was like, that was like, and I was like, we might just want to stop discussing this because I Obviously, you and I are probably not going to agree on this topic. I just, no. you know, like I don't, I, I did not know this. This was a shock to me, and I don't know. So, no, it's like, uh, um, I can't remember the, 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 the year, but oh, uh, Star Wars, Star Wars, and it's just like you were supposed to be the chosen one, or something. Like, what is, what does Obi Wan say to Anakin? It's like you were supposed to be the chosen, like when he's. He, obi-wan has the higher ground and they're fighting in like the lava or something i can't remember yes. exactly what the line is yeah and it's just like that's <laughs> you, you meet you meet you meet this guy and it's just like oh he sounds like he's pretty good and he's like now oh, i supported ben carson you are supposed to be <laughs> you're supposed to be a good liberal what happened there so i don't know i'm super excited we'll, we'll see what happens man we're gonna maybe we'll we could do like a, a 15 minute Hey, this is what happened, uh, thing or something towards the end of the week or something. Just kind of like do a rundown or, I don't know. Mm -hmm. We'll see. Yeah, because tomorrow night, in fairness, we won't be able to record because I will be at Slayer, and when I come home, there will be very little to be said that will be coherent <laughs> tomorrow <laughs> night. So, so but, you're basically going to wake up Wednesday morning and learn about the results for the election. Then, oh no, we have a DD tomorrow night that's going to come pick us up. And I already, I already literally saved all my links in a file. I have them on my phone. I will literally be, after the Slayer concert, drunk off my ass, I will be sitting there clicking all my links, going through all the, all the results. And, well, that sounds like and then tweeting like or, or screaming on Facebook about whether I liked the conclusions or not. But that, doesn't, that won't like ruin the evening. Like If there's a bunch of stuff that you don't like, you'd just be like... like hey. It's it's better than sitting in my underwear in a t shirt crying that Trump was going to win. How about that? There, there's nothing worse than that. So uh, you know, yeah, this is yeah, just the prim primaries. You know, the primaries are a big deal. Like with Alexandria uh, Ocasio Cortez, like her district that she's in, she won the primary, and it's almost an absolute shoe in that she will be taking over um, for the Democratic seat in uh, Congress there. And it's the same kind of thing with a lot of the districts that are in these primaries and all these positions. It's a shoe win. Like you're a blue district or you're a red district. Gerrymandering works both ways. And uh, hopefully these primaries, just the, the decisions that we're making tomorrow will actually be for the people who get these jobs in a lot of these cases. And so it really does matter a ton. Primaries and general are almost as, as important as each other now. Yep. Coming up on the show, in the future weeks, we're going to have Zach Law from the Zacrilege podcast. He's going to join us for an episode to uh, rehash Michigan beer. We're going to definitely talk about Michigan Ooh. beer versus Georgia beer. Um, I don't have any horses in the race. I don't know why everybody thinks I do. Like anybody who listens to the show knows I don't drink beer, but <laughs> we, we're going to talk about that. You know, and we'll talk about some other things related to his show. Um, and then, you know, we're also going to be talking with Ed Brighton from his new podcast or i guess resurrected podcast i don't know i don't know he had a radio show called culture wars he now has a podcast that he restarted the same thing we're gonna have him on talk to him a little bit about um trump obviously and about his new podcast and um we will also be talking with voters not politicians to talk about the gerrymandering um that's uh something that's very close to me i volunteered for the organization a little bit um, they have officially surpassed the Michigan Supreme Court and they're on the ballot for November. So it's mm -hmm. exciting to know that um, we're, we may be able to fix gerrymandering uh, in this year. Like, it's just amazing. And, and there's so many things to this. And, and the reason I want to get the word out is because it's important you go vote. So if you choose to say, hey, I don't support either of the Democratic or Republican candidates for governor, I'm not going to vote. It's important you go out and vote for at least this. This will help fix that. It just it will help fix all of those things. 
that will allow for us to have better jurisdiction. jurisdiction. It'll allow for us to stop taking the one or two houses a hundred miles away from the rest of the city and saying they're, you know, part of yeah, this it- district. And, and, and it's just, it opens up the opportunity right now to fix the constitution, to fix where we're at. So we don't have to deal with this in the next six to 10 years. Yeah. Without question. What we want is we want every, every seat to be contention. You know what I mean? Like it, it, it shouldn't be, okay, there's no question. It's going to be a Democrat in this spot. There's no question. It'll be a Republican in that spot. You kind of want it to be like an actual election, right? You know, like some places are going to be heavier leaning, but like there should be, you know, pretty tough battles everywhere all the time. Like it, it should be, you know, people fighting in the middle with compromise and trying to do this bipartisan stuff. That's what getting rid of gerrymandering will do. It'll remove legacy seats where you just get that position and then you have the same guy um, there for 25 years, 30 years. Like wh- I don't want that guy. I don't want that guy that's been there since since the Reagan administration making decisions about the internet. He probably doesn't even he still thinks AOL is not part of the internet. <laughs> like like you know what I mean like th- th- these are things that get decided inside our primaries and inside of our general elections on the off years and these are this is why we are going to be harping for the rest of the year until November <laughs> about how important these votes are. Exactly. And uh, I don't know. So First topic tonight that we wanted to talk about was 3D printing of guns. And I'll sort be of. honest, this is kind of an interesting topic for me because it's usually one where I'm pretty anti-gun. I'm definitely very far left on gun stands. I think there should be large amounts of regulation. And I'm I'm partially for maybe taking away all guns to begin with. But there is quite a few discussion points, I guess we could say about how uh, guns can work if you have 3D guns. And I guess this is a big thing. I, I, In fairness, my work has been so busy that I've missed this conversation. But, you know, I've seen a few libertarian yeah. people going, we should be able to print 3D guns. And I'm like, well, sure you can. Because isn't it against the law anyway to own one of those? So, sure, you could print it as long as it's not a viable usage. What do I care? Right. I mean, it's already illegal. So I, I guess I, I'm confused by what this the whole controversy was. All right. Well, just to break it down, there's been some people who have been uh, there's the basics for this. The whole idea is that there are for, for engineers, there's there are systems called CAD, computer automated design and uh, our computer assisted design is a variety of ways that you can talk about it. And what it does is it allows you in 3d or in 2d to draw, um, to draw tools, draw objects, to draw shapes, squares, circles, and essentially create a digital representation of some part, something. Uh, and then you use another, another program called a cam system. And that would take the, that 3d or that 2d thing and convert it into a language that a 3D printer or a CNC machine can take and say, okay, I need to go here, I need to go there, I need to cut, I need to cut, you know, chop, slice, whatever um, CNC program or a 3D printer. What it does is essentially, when you imagine, if you, if anyone who doesn't know what a 3D printing is, is essentially it melts plastic or rubbers or, uh, in some cases, super expensive ones can melt steels. Or metals and uh, it prints that liquid in a layer. So, like when you print something on a piece of paper, you get one layer. Well, then imagine there's another piece of paper that gets laid on top, and then you print that. Well, there's no paper here. It's literally just printing the ink. That ink dries, and then it prints another layer of ink. That ink dries, but the ink in this case is rubber, plastic, sometimes steel. And after you do that, you know these little layers add all up. And the way that the system is designed, that you get a three-dimensional object out of that. The, the issue here is there's been some young some young men uh, who and some older guys actually that uh, they love this technology and they want to just simply be able to draw these guns on the computer and then share them openly with everyone on the internet. Now, the initial you know freedom of speech issue here is the biggest one. 
And then that's kind of blurring into the Second Amendment. So the First and Second Amendment are kind of merging into one thing here. This basically says that the people, these guys are arguing that people should be free to say and whatever they want on the Internet. This is the libertarian end of these things. Um, but also conservatives uh, love this because obviously the support for the Second Amendment. So we have we should be able to say what we want on the Internet. And in the free marketplace of ideas, if it's a bad idea, the marketplace will, you know, drive our ideas away. But let's face it, that that isn't really a realistic situation. So we're making these 3D guns and this information and we want to share it with our friends out there. And they have the ability to use this, these these programs, these codes, these pictures or whatever and make 3D printing and for three to five hundred dollars, you can get a very, very, very basic uh, 3D printer. And anywhere from two to three thousand dollars, we're talking some high resolution, high quality tools that you could print a gun that would actually fire. This is plastic, so in some cases, you get so, a few shots, one or two shots, and it's it's gone. But it's still a working gun that you don't have to sign up for, pay uh, any kind of background checks so, or anything. So so great. Okay, so I'm going to stop you though for. A for a second, because you just mentioned people, libertarians feel that not being able to share the plans for this is a violation of the First Amendment. So the first question I would have, right, is if you can't legally already buy it now, so if you can't legally own a plastic gun, let's say, a it's illegal. That you could that you could shoot with, yeah. Yes, it's illegal to do that. How is it a violation of the Freedom of Speech Act? Because, and again, I kind of thought I would take the other angle on this one because I don't see the issue with it. But if they're claiming it's a violation of free speech, I mean, can you go out and get a recipe to make heroin online? Can you go out and freely get a recipe to make poison? Is that something that like is just free? You know, So if I wanted to start a website that says, how to poison your neighbor, this is exactly how you would do this if you had these ingredients. Is that legal? And that's the question. Is if it's something, the information that's out on the internet, it's the censorship question is whether or not there's a clear intent for danger to society. And that's probably part of the, the uh, I guess, the left side argument on this one or the gun control activist position on this is that this is obviously information that's going to make it more likely that there's more guns and, and essentially is more dangerous for society. Therefore, we should we should try to censor this information. And also another thing, just a disclaimer right out of the gate, this information in most cases is out there already. Like once it's on the net, you don't ever get it off. Like you just don't. Sometimes it's hard to find, but it's out there. It's it's out there forever. And there are plenty of people who just dump stuff on the Internet anonymously. And you really can just go online if you go to the right places, download this stuff and print out a gun now already. There's like the censorship idea is kind of like putting the toothpaste back in the tube. Like it's not going to happen. So this is a philosophical argument that we're having. And then um, but what happened this week was uh, there was a ruling that basically says it's illegal or it is legal for it's part of your First Amendment rights to be able to share this information out there. And then there was an injunction by a federal judge in the 11th hour right before it was supposed to go, you know, the the um, the original people in the, the court case. Um, they were just set up, ready to start distributing. And uh, a judge said, no, you guys can't do this. I'm stopping you. Uh, and obviously the, the, the stuff still went out on the internet. It's, it's out there now. You can go see it. So, but the whole thing is just like, you can't get it back in the tube, but the ruling said it was okay for them to share this stuff on the internet. And then obviously the Democrats, they made this a real big thing. And they, this is part of where I have an issue is they were, they had, they were saying that we're going to have guns on airplanes. These are plastic and completely untraceable, undetectable. And they're showing pictures of these plastic guns and stuff where, (laughs) There's a lot of physical properties and problems with this. Like I said, you may only get a couple of shots on a gun like this, and it it, it will melt or it's be incredibly dangerous, could blow up in your hands. Like there's all kinds of really big problems. But I don't care what you're doing. If you have a 3D plastic printed gun, you need a steel bullet. You need lead bullets. You need metal casings. There's no way you're getting the ammunition on the plane too. So the whole idea of 
ARs and plastic guns on airplanes, it is it, from a start, it's a, it's a non-starter. It's not possible because there are no plastic bullets. So you, there, you so, can't have it fully plastic. So there. So uh, I get again. I'm going to interrupt. I I, I got to stop you though. You know. So I get it, right? You you have to use metal bullets. You, it, you're right. It's let's let's move past the the airplane argument because that's just dumb. Like I'm yeah, sorry, that's just a dumb argument. I, I had, and in fairness, I had to bring it the, up just to beat it up. You, and you're right, you do because people have used. I've seen that argument used, and you know, look at it this way: they use the argument about you know it being brought on planes, but yet people are getting their buttholes probed and they're going through <laughs> purses. They're they're not going to get this on a plane. It's just no. It's it, it's just very illogical to happen. So I googled well, an article. You've got those weird things where you stand and put your arms up in the air and like it can see everything. Like you yeah. can't like hide it. Like, yeah. <laughs> you're like, oh, your dick's five inches long. Oh, that guy's dick's <laughs> 10 inches long. You know, I mean, they're, they're going to go, hmm, he's really short. He has a big dick. Maybe we'll search him. I don't, I don't know what the hell they do. I just, I know it's ridiculous, you know, that anybody's going to think you're going to get away with bringing that onto a plane. Now, how about this? I, I just randomly Googled. We were talking about killing your neighbor with poison, right? You know, like I just, okay. I was like, so I, I Googled how to make poison for and my neighbor. now you're on a federal list. <laughs> pro, pro, I, dude, I've been on a federal list for a long time, I'm sure. Yeah. So the Telegraph has this article, and this is back from 2005, right? The five deadly poisons that can be cooked up in the kitchen. And they talk about in 1978, there was murderer Giorgio Markovo a Bulgarian, Bulgarian dis, descent. And he <laughs> took seven days to die after an assassination attempt fired, an assassin fired a poison pellet into him using an, an umbrella at a train station, right? So this guy has a umbrella that can fire a pellet that has this weird thing, called, this weird poison called ricin. R I C I N. It's ricin. Ricin. And it's basically derived from castor oil beans. And if you ingest it in just this dose, it stops your body's immune system and you die from infection. Right? Yeah. So it's horrible. Exactly. This is out there. You can make this. Now, they don't have a recipe on how to make this, but I'm sure if oh, I Googled farther, I could it's just find a pellet it. Gun. Exactly, just like a, a pellet gun, and you just put it inside of an umbrella. And, and so, I, I'm going to challenge you a little bit here and say, this stuff's out there already. If people really wanted to go through the excessive effort to do this, they could. They could mm-hmm. do this. And in fairness, I don't think terrorists or other people are going to do these extreme long term things to get weapons of destruction to kill people that's going to be super complex you know people go out and and, and have mass murders at schools because the guns are readily available to them they're in their home so they're not locked up it doesn't matter they're there you know we don't have good background checks that goes hey everybody in the home has to pass this you know at my house I probably would be the one that would pass the pass the check, yeah. you know, for the crazy side of things because I have a temper, you know, and I drink, right? <laughs> but they have all those other things, and, and 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 why are we worried? And again, maybe I'm just being cynical here, but why am I worried about people printing plastic guns when they can do all these other dangerous things made from common household items? All right, so my whole thing on this one is that I was thinking about. What is the actual danger here? Like, what is really the danger? The airplane thing is something that's scary, and it get a lot of headlines. And when you see when people hear it being yelled into the ether on whatever cable news channel you are currently on, that's not real, though. So, what is the real thing that I'm worried about here? It's like I was saying earlier. I'm an actual CNC machinist. I could go online and get the pieces, and I could make all of the small steel parts. And I guarantee you, I could have a gun that could fire over and over and over again in a short period of time just you know a hobbyist amount of time so like this is this is something that's in my capabilities uh for three to four thousand dollars you can buy a machine on the internet on craigslist that'll do all of this stuff with some time you need to learn how to use it but that that would be that so 
that's metal though. The, the their 3D printing thing that I'm worried about is, you know, like I said, 500 to a thousand dollars. You could have a nice one that can make these things. I'm afraid of people making these things relatively easy. I mean, this is it is really a plug and play operation. It's simple. All you do is load the file into the machine. You have to learn how to use the machine, but load the load the 3D file into the machine. It puts together its own code. So there's there's stuff called G code and it moves. Imagine like a printer moving around and spraying the ink. That that it basically tells it where the where the jet needs to go. And you, you're printing out these tools. My what I'm afraid of is someone who has a few dollars printing backpacks full of these things. It's just crappy one five bullet shooting pieces of you know, whatever, and you throw them away and you know, fifty bucks, a hundred bucks, you know, here's a gun. You just throw it away after you do whatever. I mean, like th- this is a, a thing that I see turning into an underground, untraceable, you know, we talk about gun control in this country and how we want we, we the, the compromise we're willing to make is, yes, you can have guns if you're a responsible gun owner, at least on my end of things. I know you're a little bit more restrictive than I am. But like this thing, this is a very democratizing of, uh, a factor to guns all over this country. They may be cheap, crappy little guns, but enough of these cheap, crappy little guns that can be made very easily, it, you can create an underground black market of completely untraceable because they don't trace it where ammunition is purchased. You don't have to put your name down for that kind of stuff. So like I just see this being another way for things to get even easier for someone who really wants to, you know, to use a gun in a very, very bad way. I would, I would much rather we use, you know, the, the deep state. I would love to use, you know, regulatory things to, to hold these kinds of things in place. It's like what we talked about for certain words, how you and I would be a little bit more, open to, um, to, um, I guess, censorship in certain areas where the government comes in. And we basically, yes, I'll give up some more of my freedoms to, to, uh, act as like a, um, a guiding force with the government. And this would be an area where I would say that is okay. I don't know how you, you can't get the toothpaste back in the tube, but you know, doing something to, to regulate this instead of just freely letting it flow all over is um is at least something is some kind of proactive thing because I think just saying well there's nothing we can do I guess we're just gonna have to watch out like that it doesn't seem like we're you know being uh effective enough and so like so I would agree with you except for what what's the cost so you you're right you know getting these plans out to CNC mills creating a huge underground market I, I would agree with you that would be pretty scary you know yeah it's a 3D gun scary. I mean, there's an article from ARS Technica, right? And I, I'm sure you'll disagree a little bit with this article. They're definitely not the uh, most liberal publication out there. But, you know, they, they essentially were able to replicate an era 15 in three days, right? Mm-hmm. That, that's yeah. pretty stunning. Unserial, they called it a ghost gun. But yep. they said the cost for that was slightly over three grand. So you for the the machine and the plastic, yes, and every and everything that goes into it. So it's not just as easy as people want to make it out to be. But that's a big complex gun. So that's what I'm saying. Like the the little handguns that we're talking about. Imagine an L shape with four holes in it, and then there's a firing pin and a trigger. Like that's all it needs to be. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Bad Boys, Bad Boys Two. Oh no! The, oh no! Bad Boys. I think it is. At I the never end saw of it, the this, second one. I saw the first the, one. The but first the one, one. At the end of the first movie, he, this guy has. I think it's at that movie. This guy has this weird, tiny little pocket gun that ha- doesn't have a revolver. It just has four barrels, and when you pull the trigger, it shoots four bullets at the same time. It's designed to basically do close range, go through Kevlar, and kill a police officer. And that kind of shape, where it's just kind of a small rectangular thing with holes in it a firing pin and some way to lock it down like that simple of a gun is what I, is what I'm talking about here. So like everybody loves to use the big assault rifle, a big honking aggressive thing, but it needs to be, you know, it doesn't need to be that big, like a 22 bullet put next to your body with a tiny little gun could go easily through you and into the next person standing next to you. Like that's what I'm worried about. Not like these big assault things. I'm worried about something that'll fit in your pocket. You can shoot someone at close range and they will never have anything even remotely like a murder weapon to find because you can just grind it up and throw it away. Like that's what I'm scared of. And I, I get that. And I get in a, a small situation, one or two people, 
you're going to knock off, right? But you're not going to get more than a couple of shots out of these things. You're just nope. not. But, and so, but you don't need more than one or two, man. That's four. the thing. Like, this isn't like a, a weapon of mass, just, you know, m- you know, mass murder. But like, if you want to kill somebody and you don't want your name anywhere near a gun list, or let's say you're a felon and you can't buy a gun at all, like, the, uh, besides like buying a, a a a black market gun for however much they go for, I don't know. Maybe 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 some guys like, man, I printed these all out in my basement. I got a bunch of them. They're twenty five dollars a piece. All you got to do is go buy bullets or something. I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm hoping it won't be that easy. But I mean, if if let's say if you got one of those those, those so like you said three thousand dollars, let's say twenty five hundred bucks for that thing. If you sell them at twenty five dollars a piece, all you need to do is sell a hundred little tiny guns, and you, you've got your money back. I, I guess, and I agree. I agree that we should be regulating this, but I just don't know if, if it's worthy of jumping off the deep end and being that up that that crazily paranoid about it, you know? I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I just well, it's I, a I new don't... technology problem. It's a new technology problem that we have. So like we have this this maker device, the thing that you can make stuff with. And it's just like when we had the internet and people were like viruses and everybody's computers are getting stuffed full of horrible stuff and you're you were getting hacked. Like we had this new technology and it opened us all up to these new weaknesses and we had to find a solution to fix it. We are we're gonna have to find a solution to fixing this 3D printing stuff. I don't see any way to say nope. You can't have 3D printers anymore. I, I don't think that's gonna be a possibility. And there's no way to get everything off the internet unless you start completely big brothering the internet. So like, what is a you know a proactive solution that we can do here? I don't know. I'm not a politician, but I, I do think that we need to at least be aware of what's going on. And like the whole, you know, assault rifles on airplanes and, you know, that kind of stuff. That's not what I'm worried about. And I don't think anybody should be. They should be worried about the little ones that could, you know, be undetected. And then, I don't know. That's pretty much the whole, like, but like pretty much the whole reason I wanted to do this, this is just to give people more information about it. So like, it's not difficult for you to 3D print this stuff. I think it's more dangerous for this information to be out for people like me who can make real guns. But um, it also that people just need to know what's real. Like the, the, the AR thing, that's not really a, a realistic situation. That's because, like you said, three thousand dollars for a plastic gun that you might be able to fire one or two bullets with. You're just not going to do it. That's it's not worth your time. But a little square peg that'll shoot twenty twos. Yeah, I can see people doing that. Yeah, and that's true. And and you know, and then that's in fairness, that's kind of what um, the article can kind of conclude to. What they talk about how. There could be an increase in cartels. There could be an increase in gangs collecting some of these cheaper type weapons that are going to get around the ATF. They make murders harder. You know, it's a lot harder to fingerprint something when it comes from a ghost gun than it is if it comes from a traceable gun. And and and, and, and don't get me wrong here. I'm not saying we shouldn't find a solution for this. I just don't know if right now to be this big reactionary, why, why wouldn't we work on the policies of it instead of worrying about where we're going to be at, you know, three or four years from now, I'm saying, let's find the policies to stop this. Let's work on how do you regulate something like this? What have we done in the past? I mean, think about it this way. Technically any one of us could grow opium in our backyard and manufacture heroin and sell it, (laughs) but it's a lot harder to find people to have heroin. So, in my opinion, it kind of goes back to owning guns. How do we find a happy medium? Do you need 17 handguns? No. <laughs> you need yeah. one, maybe two handguns. A lot of people will be like, well, I like to collect them, blah, blah, blah. Well, I like it, it's, it's kind of like saying, well, it would be like if I wanted to collect different types of heroin, you'd be like, well, no, you can't <laughs> own that. What if you distribute that to different people? Well, it's the same thing. What if you shoot other people? So, you know. I think the bigger gain here is is that they expand the laws to include these crazy contraptions you can get, these ghosted things. They say, hey, if you create this and you don't register it, there's a higher liability you could have. So, for example, if you're if you're out there and you get pulled over driving down the road and you have a ghost gun in the back back of your car, it's double the felony of having another illegal weapon. I mean, I think that's how we can manage some of those. Um, offshoots that we're see- we're going to see with 3D printing. I mean, it's going to happen. People are going to soon be able to print their own food. 
you know, at some <laughs> yeah. point that's going to happen. And, and, and then they're going to die from it. Cool stuff. Yeah, the people, these people will die from it, and they're going to want to sue the 3D printing companies because they were dumb enough to try and print their own food. You know, it's kind of the same thing. <laughs> so I, I think the, the key here is, is we don't need to go after regulating these guns. We need to go after regulating gun control on a larger scale to say, hey, hold on a second, folks. Let's not own 100 guns. You can have one or two. I don't care if it's a plastic piece of crap gun that you printed on your 3D printer or if you went and bought it at a gun shop. You don't need to own 17 of them. You can have two. That's your limit. And we can start creating penalties to help take care of that. Plus, if you create a society that has more socialistic benefits to it, people have less need for guns, less need for murder, and less need for hurting other people. But hey, who are we <laughs> to talk about how you know a socialistic method could have you know could benefit the United States? I don't know. Just well, we're spitballing this, this. This entire thing is we're just at the beginning of it. Like we're just starting to deal with the philosophical situation here. Uh, yeah, that's really the whole thing is that we're just starting to figure this out. Just like when the internet first came around or just when television first came around they, there's all kinds of new things that it's changing our society with and we'll have to just we'll have to figure out a way to make it work and hopefully we can find one that so that people are using this technology to innovate and create brand new better things to better our lives as opposed to creating tools of destruction i i, I would love to see society do something a little bit more positive than oh i can make my own things i'm gonna make something to kill people with like it's such <laughs> a it's such a it, it ruins all of technologies when when what the first thing that humans decide to do when they have brand new technology is to make some kind of weapon it always frustrates me yeah i would agree it's about as frustrating as some of the reports that I've read that came out of Cleveland, Ohio, of all places, um, about a Trump rally where there was two gentlemen, I won't name their age, who got caught wearing shirts that said, I'd rather be Russian than Democrat. And these guys, they, they lived through the Cold War. I mean, yes. these are these are older guys like their 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 fathers possibly fought in the war where Russians murdered. Oh, these guys know. are old. these guys could have easily themselves. I don't know. The, I, would say the war. I don't know. World War Two. A lot of the World War Two veterans are in their 80s. I don't know if those guys are that old, but all right, that's fair. You're right. I could be wrong. You know, we could probably yeah. just Google their names and find them somewhere. I'm sure they're somewhere yeah. on the internet. Well, oh, they they look like grandpas, but they didn't look like great grandpas. <laughs> 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 but either way, yeah, I remember I saw the picture on that one. It's just uh, and people are so quick to jump on these, you know, wild s sayings and stuff without thinking about what's really being said. Because I don't know, I, I find it I find it a bit interesting that conservatives are are for some reason really seeming to like the totalitarian and, and authoritarian stuff coming out of the russians right now like why would they why would they say that's that's better it's because they've been ingrained with this complete anger at democrats it's, it's like this complete splitting of the of the political spectrum and, and you know the funny thing is is I'm sitting, we're sitting here having this conversation, right? You know, we're sitting here talking about this. And I hate when we talk about the, you know, two structured government, right? You know, we have a Democrats, we have the GOP, but this right here just demonstrates it. Like, I mean, they don't, they literally would rather have a Russian than a Democrat, which is, you know, essentially them saying, well, I'd rather see Putin run the nation than Hillary. It's just insane to me. Like, they, their quotes, and they were asked about their shirts, right? And he, and they said they didn't understand why Trump was getting so much criticism about Russia when Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama were not similarly scrutinized. They were uh, asked I, what they could tell Democrats, and they said they just need to jump on board of the this train and give Trump a chance. And I'm sitting here going, hold on, hold on a second. Hillary and Obama had nothing to do with Russians. Like, I don't understand the correlation. You're not even talking logic here. You're literally just spewing a garbage discussion. That's it. Well, 
Hillary and Hillary and Barack Obama both um, they had communication with the Russians because they were in the government. Like they had to communicate with the Russians in some place. And Obama actually a few times tried to reach out and tried to figure things out, tried to smooth out the entire Crimean problem. And the conservatives at the time lambasted and ridiculed President Obama for trying to make nice with this Russian dictator, this evil man, this 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 USSR um, crony who used to be part of the KGB. And now it's 180 because one of their guys is really cool with it. Like it's just it, – it, it's a it's a, a flip, you know, a topsy-turvy, uh, um, you know, two-faced thing that, that really comes down to it's just party loyalty. And I mean if, if the Democrats all of a sudden started supporting some, some leader in a country who has horrifying human rights accords and – uh, is it you know basically is the uh, antithesis of what a democratic nation would be? I would tell the Democrats to go jump off a cliff. I mean, I really could if it came to be that bad. Like these guys here are an example of you know they're just they're going to ride the wagon. Like if the if the if their party if their party says jump, they say how high. And like there's a there's a lack of critical thinking there that that worries me. Because I could say no to the Democratic Party. I could. I don't know if I could ever see some way to support the GOP. I don't, I don't, I don't think there's any way that I could ever really get that far. But I could definitely hang out the center right if necessary. Because if the Democrats went just because Louis, because one of the other things that I like, or I, I like to mention is like these guys are supporting, they're saying it's better to be a Russian than a Democrat. So they're essentially, like, this is the literal thing that they're saying. It is better to be non-democratic, as in democracy, to, to be an autocratic state where essentially a family or a king or a ruler, just dynastic control. That's better than the United States electoral process. Yeah. I, what? Yeah, exactly. And, and, and it's a contributor and commentator for MSNBC, Ron Reagan, right? Reagan of all things. You know, and, and you would think immediately... Ronald Reagan, but it's not. He's dead. Doesn't <laughs> he's not here anyway? Well, it, you know, it's not. It, it's not his son, is it? Because I know his I, son. I don't was, think uh, so. His son was in the um, in uh, the atheistic circles during the last election, and he actually he did some stuff. With, we, we had a, a, com a commercial or something where he's like, "Not afraid of burning in hell." Because I think he was support supporting the Freedom from Religion Foundation. You know what? Maybe it is. And maybe yeah, that is. Maybe we, maybe we, I'm crazy. We, no, we used to, we used to run it on our show. It was a commercial or something that you had yeah. lifted and threw on our. So, anyways, back to Ron Reagan on MSNBC or whatever. Yeah. So, essentially, he he's saying this, right? You know, he he's basically saying that people like that Trump hates the same people they hate. Is that Trump's can considered and said, hey, if they're not like you and they're not struggling. And they're not struggling in the same way you are. We we should hate them because they're the ones taking you down. And that's been a big Trump message. I mean, we we can <laughs> you can argue all you want that Trump doesn't create dissension, but he does. That's what he does really well. That's what got him elected. He created dissensions farther in the ranks than you can even imagine. I mean, I, I remember watching the debates between him, him and Hillary. And he literally sit there and couldn't even bother to respect her when she was talking. He literally had to pace the stage, put his hand behind his back, make facial expressions, <laughs> yeah. and sigh and him and haw and randomly inter interrupt her. It's insane to sit here and, and think he had zero respect. He didn't care. He's like, if I lose, what do I care? I'm going to come out on top because people are going to believe that I'm correct because I'm just open about who I hate. I'm just the quintessential honest guy. I'm the average Joe telling you how it is. But he's not. He's just a, a liar that's creating this big dissension between all these other people. And here he is teaming up with somebody in a foreign country Ooh. who is anti-free speech of all things. Like, like all these, these people voting for Trump are like, Yes, we need 3D printed guns and you should stop telling us why we can't get our things. And Trump supports us and the NRA supports us. But yet 
they're working in with Ru- yeah. in a Russia, country you, that violates free against, speech all the time. All the time. If you, go, if you go to Russia and say something against Vladimir Putin, you could just disappear. Like you could just just no longer be there. Uh, that's like I, I don't think that these people understand the severity of what they're they're laughing about. So uh, it's one of the funny things about um, the, uh, the like what you were talking about. Like Trump is like you know saying what's on his mind. I do think there is something to that that I really wish we would see a little bit more in the uh, the American political process. Is that people the candidates being authentic? Like Trump is authentically horrifying. But he's authentic. Like the closest thing we saw to authenticity was Bernie Sanders and John Stewart had this on his show. It's like people were calling him a crazy cuckoo bird. And uh, John finished up the it's one of the when Bernie had a rally or something like twenty thousand people, and John finished it up and he says that you guys may think that this is wild and eccentric and weird, but just the American people are not used to not having a polished, completely you know. A non-realistic politician. It's weird when we're seeing authenticity, and you may think that being weird uh, in the political process, but that's just a real person, and that we see that as different and eccentric now because they're not authentic when they run for offices, like Hillary and Barack. Barack was a little, he was pretty authentic, and uh, he got a little bit less so as as his uh, term went on. He became much, much more of a politician, but like. Authenticity is important, especially to the middle class and lower class and who've been basically seeing nothing but polished turds in their perspective. Now they've got this guy who is authentic, but he's authentic in, in such a way that it's really d- dangerous for our, our democratic sp- space that we have. And un- hopefully the Democrats will take a page out of that and try to find some authenticity in, um, in some of theirs. We're seeing that some of uh, um, the Bernie Sanders Our Revolution candidates that – you know that that democratic socialist party is really growing right now and there's a lot of real authentic non-polished people that are uh, that are running for election this year yeah and and so i dug up an art, older article right this is from 2016 july 27th it is from the new york times and i'm sure trump would say they're horrible people but they have an article called Donald Trump calls on Russia to find Hillary Clinton's messy emails. And here we are two years later talking about collusion and how there is pretty good evidence that, that Russia was involved in our election. And here he is asking them to do it. Now, again, it, it'd be kind of like if we had a cult leader stand up and say, hey, it'd be nice if you all killed yourselves in the name of Jesus Christ. Don't do it. But go ahead and do that. You know, we we aren't saying you have to. We just say we think this would be better for the world. Right. I mean, that's we're we're seeing this. We're seeing a guy that became president that was talking all of this garbage about how I don't care. I don't give a crap about what's going on. I just want Russia to get to the bottom and find the truth. Well, (laughs) if they found the truth about the missing emails, that's news to me. We do know that they they found democratic collusion and threw the Democratic Party into chaos. And oh, by the way, people became disinterested in Clinton and wanted to vote for Trump. Now, I'm not saying that some of the issues that Clinton had, we should not consider, you know, issues, right? We really should. Yeah. I, that's that's a fair round I mean, she was not the strongest candidate to run against a and, populist guy. Like exactly. Yeah. And the Democratic Party bought into something very uh, uh, systemic to, you know, poison culture, I guess, is the nicest way to look at it. We have a two-party mm-hmm. system that, that's, that's poisonous in, in, in what they're delivering us. And, and fine, it was called out. We saw it. It's here. Now, how do we change that? But we, again, have all these people blindly supporting a president without actually looking at it. I remember when Barack Obama got questioned for bombing Iran, you know, with all these tactical missiles from these drones, right? And I had somebody like to say, hey, you do know that Obama's killed more people through drones than anybody else. Yep, you're right. Actually, I agree with you. And I think it's disgusting. And I rally against that. And if Obama were to come to my city or to my town and I were able to get to ask a question, the first question I would ask is, 
Why did you do that? Do you understand mm-hmm. how this undermines our democracy? Do you understand why I disagree with you on it? But if you're forcing me to choose Obama bombing people in Iran versus Trump, I'm going to choose Obama. So stop giving me two choices. The problem is, is Trump didn't just break the two-party system. He took the two-party system and only broke one part of it and took everything for himself and said, hey, look, I could create dissension over here. Therefore, I get elected. It's a business tactic. It's a clear and simple business tactic that he he used. And instead of people recognizing this and saying, well, you know what, Trump, you're the exact same as everybody else. They're saying, no, he's better. He's the freestanding, you know, demigod of GOP conservatism. He's a fresh start to the GOP party. No, he's not. He's just well, an insane lunatic who knows how to bring investors on board and, and, and create a system where, you know, he can oust one party and make basically our country a one party system. Well, he's running. Uh, people were talking that about Donald Trump is a businessman and he's going to run the country like a business. You just said it's like a corporate atmosphere. It's a top down authoritarian thing. There's, there's a reason why he's more comfortable around authoritarian leaders, it seems, than democratically elected leaders who love the global um, community. I mean, did you see how how awkward he has been with the uh, leaders of uh, of uh, England, France and Germany? He just I will say the French president, Macron, he did a good job of just kind of like sugarcoating and shining everything up for Trump. But they do fight quite a bit. But like one of the issues that with with Trump's um, he he thrives in chaos. And it's one of the things that he's always done with his uh, his businesses. Essentially, is bet on everything. And if it fails, you just kill it and start over. You can't quite do that in politics because you can't just start over brand new United States and just declare bankruptcy. But a lot of the same things that he used to do in there was so chaos. And then when everybody was yelling and screaming, he would reach in and grab all the important stuff and split or he would be in charge of it now. And then he would be able to do what he wanted. Like this, this sowing division thing, this is a tactic that he's used for years and it's effective. It works very well. The only problem is, is that when you run a country like a business, it works in the short term. We look at the U.S. economy. It's been, it's been growing. It's been growing faster than expected. People are believing that it's overheating. Well, the Trump tax plan is going to be coming in, and we're going to be, we're going to be getting fully into the Trump economic plan next year. And a lot of these people who are like, eh, I'd rather be Russian than Democrat and all these stuff, like it's the, the uh, unemployment is super low. There's a lot of people that used to be just not looking for jobs at all. They're getting back into the market. A lot of these middle class people think that they're going to be getting a bunch more money back next year um, because of the ta- Trump tax plan. And they're, they're still on this optimistic that they think Trump's actually going to deliver. And when we get to the real consequences of a lot of these decisions that, that this administration has been making when it comes to the EPA, when it comes to financing, I mean, inflation growing faster than wage growth. So if you didn't get a raise last year, you're actually making less money. So, that, I mean, that, that's a reality of what everything costs more. There's, there's all kinds of things that are becoming to roost. And Trump can, can try to sow chaos as much as he can. But a government can't just be thrown away when it's done. So we'll see if he can keep fighting and coming out here. And we'll see if these people, um, when they never do get that, that promised loaf of bread, whether or not they stick around. Yeah, exactly. And and I don't know. I hope I hope it goes south for that part. I, I, I really do. I just I, but I, it, part of that, though, is that the U.S. has to have a crisis. We have to have an economic crisis of some kind. You know, so people, they don't wake up until there's some kind of, you know, sad thing happening. Like the, the economic crisis that we had in 2008 woke people up to banks in predatory loaning predatory loans like then now the average the average people are a little bit freaked out by that kind of stuff like i hate to say it but you know i don't want this i don't want our country to go into a crisis and and into a recession but i don't know what else it's going to wake up people to what the trump administration has been doing is pulling the wool over our eyes well i do know what will wake me up a religious task force and and, (laughs) you know I don't know. It, this is like 
seeing Jeff Sessions not poop all over marijuana. He's <laughs> pooping all over the rest of the Constitution. And I, I, yeah, I don't know. You know, I, I just. That's not a nice visual. I don't really enjoy that visual there. Jeff Sessions and it looks enough like the weird turkey lawyer from uh, Futurama. But. <laughs> I'll say, I'll say, i say. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, man. that's one and of the he, things whenever I, I hear him or uh, Mitch McConnell talk, all I can think of is uh, bad parodies of Catcher, or not um, uh, Catcher and Rye. Um, um, oh, man, how did I lose the uh, the Kill I Mockingbird. I the Kill you're right. Mockingbird. Except for for me, Mitch McConnell will always be the turtle, and I, yeah. and you could think well, John Stewart for that. But I mean, it's the turtle. If I yeah. see a turtle, I think Mitch McConnell instantaneously. <laughs> like the other day, I was driving home from work, right, and um, there was a turtle crossing the freeway. I have no idea why, but I stopped and I pulled over. And I grabbed the turtle and I turned it around and I pointed it back towards the grass. And I'm like, I don't know where you belong. I have no idea where you came from, but you definitely don't belong in traffic. Go this way. And I thought, this is what I feel like if like the Democrats could take over, they could pick up Mitch McConnell, turn him around and be like, I get it, sir. I get that you're I get that you don't understand much else. When you get put in one direction, you can only focus one way. But let me help turn you around. And move you in another direction because you can help change America for the better if you just went a little farther in the other direction. And that's how I see Mitch McConnell. I don't know. Maybe it's S and I to me to think that way, but that's how I feel. It's just the old white guy with white hair syndrome. It's really it's just what I I, I, I mean, yes, there are a lot of progressive liberal uh, white guys, but man, the ones that are in government that are in charge right now, it's just, it's almost stereotypical. Like Jeff Sessions is a caricature in and of himself. This, this whole, this whole concept of this, uh, religious, religious Liberty task force, like the whole thing is essentially trying to get the government to recognize and, and protect the religious views because for some reason they think they're being attacked yeah, it's the same. It's like it's like when Ken Ham goes, you know what? Creationism it's the only way to believe. Oh wait, you secularists, you people, you want to believe evolution works? I'll show you. I'm going to build a big ark on government money, and I'm going to pretend like I I know everything, and you're all going to come and pay me money to learn about something you could learn in a book. And oh, the reason our public schools don't teach it is because it's not fact. But guess what? It is really fact. You just are too stupid to know and stop giving the government money and give me money. That's what it is. Like, that's exactly what Jeff Sessions is doing. He's sitting here saying, it's a dangerous movement, undetected by many, but it's real. It is now. It's now challenging and reloading, eroding our great tradition of religious freedom. What? What? What are you talking about? How is it eroding your your religious freedom? You can go worship in your home. Just don't take your worship and walk into my home and say, you better worship like me, or guess what? I'm not going to give you your discount. I'm not going to give allow you to get your Medicaid. I'm not going to give you this. It's like he's holding all these other government institutions hostage just to get his way in the religious freedom movement. And that, that folks... That's what this religious task force feels like to me. I th- I really see two things on this. So one is he's talking about losing religious freedom. What he's what he's basically talking about here is losing a monopoly so on this country. He, exactly. He's, he's, he's about talking about losing, losing Christian freedom. Let's just can we yes. can we be honest, Hannah? He's talking to, not about religion, religious freedom. He's worried about losing white. Christian freedom. Just define yes. it that way and see how it flows. That's that's how it should be said, really. What they're 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 saying they're losing the freedom. They're losing the good old boy freedom. No no where you can, white you Christian can say, freedom. Say it. I want to yes, hear you say it, it. Yeah, white Christian freedom. That's Thank what they're losing. <laughs> and essentially they want to be able to do the things like they you keep hearing about these these Supreme Court cases where the 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 baker says, no, I'm not going to bake you a cake for your gay wedding. 
I, I should be allowed to do that based on my religious beliefs. No, you can't come in my store. I refuse to serve you. No, you can't sit at that counter, Mr. African American. I have deep religious beliefs in uh in the Mormon the old the original Mormon tradition, which says that African American dark skin is the mark of Cain and my religion says I should not, you know, fraternize with you and serve you and allow you whatever reasons that uh, deeply held religious beliefs those are discriminatory and we've we've had these conversations we've talked about these things what jeff sessions is saying is that he wants that to be legal like it used to be back in the good old days this that's that's part of what this is is this is really it's about losing the monopoly on white christian freedom on the whole idea of what this country was before multiculturalism and real globalism and real religious freedom hit. Real religious freedom makes you respect and diversify your your um, your politics and your your government regulations, not close down on one. So they're not losing anything here. And then the other thing is is that these these kinds of things that he's saying on this, like what he's saying there, this is a dangerous movement. Uh, this sounds kind of freaky. He says this task force will help uh, my de- the, the de- department fully implement religious liberty guidance by ensuring that all Justice Department components are upholding the guidance in the cases uh, they bring and defend. The arguments is that they make in court the policies and regulations they adopt and how we conduct our operations. That includes making sure that employees know their duties to accommodate people of faith. I don't know what kind of accommodations you need to make besides uh, uh, like when uh, a Hasidic man on an airplane says he will not sit next to a woman and they have to stop and change the seating because of you know a crazy uh, religious demand like that. Or, you know, uh, and, and like what kind of demand would you be making for the Justice Department and for the, uh, for the religious besides – um, using you know your religion as some some kind of discriminatory thing like you don't hear about that very often so I don't I don't know what else they that they're not being accommodated for uh, that just that Sessions wants them to protect besides what we mentioned a little while ago just being able to 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 refuse service to people that you exactly. don't like based on your religion yeah and what does that remind you of if you walk into other countries Hannah if you go to other countries they have task force you know they're called morality police right they, yep. they call them that like they have other areas and and i'll be honest all right all right i'll be i'll be a little honest with you and say hey i'm very i want to be very cautious in attacking um muslim pos- policies right but in fairness if we look at muslim countries that dictate a religious tax force you're looking at muslim task force that are doing the exact same things that we're seeing in america the difference is they're just in another country that has a little bit more. Um, well, they've already they've already made the laws. Say. Yeah. yeah. Yes, it's they a, already have laws that dictate. Theocracy. Yeah, it's an actual theocracy, and so like I, I honestly, I think Jeff Sessions would be completely comfortable in a theocracy, a Christian theocracy. I think Mike Pence would vote for that in a heartbeat to make Christianity the official religion of the United States. Oh, he, there would be no hesitation on his end. Jeff Sessions as well. I really don't think there would be any, even remotely, a hesitation there. And then, but we we don't even have to go as far down the slippery slope for the morality police. I just I I'm scared of that happening. But that whole idea of like task force and morality police, those things kind of ring true. But I just thinking about what what Sessions was saying there. I was thinking of like I was looking for. Um, I don't know if you remember uh, Ayatollah Khomeini. He basically he's not Khomeini. That's the guy who uh, did the fatwa against Salman Rushdie. Um, that guy was just that he was the one that uh, was part of the, uh, the Iranian revolution that essentially ruined that country um, for the uh, turning into a full fledged uh, Islamic theocracy. But Ayatollah Khomeini, he was giving a speech at a uh, science. Um, a scientific university and in his speech he said this is the following so you heard what i said about protecting what sessions had said about protecting uh um you know the people of faith of faith and uh helping the department fully implement religious liberty this is what community said 
said, besides this country benefits from spirituality, honorability, attention to God, faith, and trust in God. If this happens, it will be the most efficient and influential factor in attracting people's faith and hearts. You can, say, you can save humanity if we go sit beside individuals and explain things for each and every one of them with the purpose of attracting their minds to faith in God and Islam. Today, the satanic, satanic apparatus apparatuses and powers of the world are pushing people into the quagmire of ignorance and deviation on a daily basis and they control everything that is opposed to their satanic movement like hearing jeff sessions explain why we need a religious liberty task force and then hearing ayatollah khamenei talk about how religion is the biggest thing that's going to be helping growth in the country and find people get them closer to god and to uh, uh, fight satanic apparatuses. Like, there's not that much of a difference between the way they talk and the way they sound there. That's another thing that scares me, because we used to have a nice separation of church and state where you, they would, you know, if you gave a speech or something at a church, you could bring on your, your faithful talk. But it, it wasn't part of the, the f- like, that I, I, I'm not very familiar with uh, in the past, where it was part of the official you know, press conference like this is, and this is, this is, this is part of that theocratic slippery slope that I'm worried about is that, I mean, like I said, they would love to do something like that. And I, I am scared of these kinds of things being turned into you know full fledged law in this country. Exactly. And, and you know, there, there was an NPR um, show <laughs> to put it nicely you know, where they interviewed somebody named um, Emma Green, right? And she writes for The Atlantic. She's just a reporter. But they talk about the exercise of uh, of your freedom of speech, your freedom of expression of all religious beliefs. And, you know, they talk about, you know, how this administration wants to focus on conservative voters. And I won't name white people, but it's kind of what it is, you know, if focus on conservative evangelistic born again Christians and Catholics that they can bring into their corner, right? They're not even worried at this point about where they stand on half the other beliefs. They just need them to vote for their administration for their candidate. And I'm sitting here saying, hold on a second. Where's the cultural change? Where are we going to go with this? If you support all these cultural changes. And again, I'm going to go back to the beginning of the episode where we talked about a future relative of mine. We talked about a a a, a boyfriend of somebody that uh, my sister dates, right? Who wanted to vote for Ben Carson in the election. And I, I just simply started out by saying, hey, you should go vote for Abdul, but at minimum, just go vote in the primary. And it's like, well, I don't agree with Bernie, and I don't agree with any of the Abdul and all these other things. And it's like, hold on a second. You're a minority. You... You and I agree on all the horrible discord going on, the horrible sexism, the horrible racism that we're seeing, and yet you don't want to change it? Why? Where's where's the change in this? How do you not want to see a future that doesn't exist with this? How can you even look at a GOP candidate and go, yup, I want to side with the white conservatives? I don't understand it. It makes no sense to me. You, you're for LGBT rights. You're for minorities getting equal treatment in government. You're for minorities getting equal treatment in employment. You're for getting rid of and disbanding large corporations and supporting unions. How do you not want to, how how do you want to vote for at least, at least a more progressive candidate, whether it's Abdul or not? How do you not want to vote for a progressive candidate? How do you go from the guy that, that has, that's a neurosurgeon? And 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 is now a housing commission, you know, director. I I just I don't understand it. It, it makes no logical well, so, sense to me. It's basically just what I was saying. Is essentially it's it the, the African American conservative. They are they're there. They're real. They exist. And uh, they're also the Latin American conservative. Uh, we find that in the the Catholic communities that they, they they don't always vote the way you would expect immigrants to vote in this country. Um, but. You mentioned earlier, it's just like they're looking for the white evangelical and uh, essentially the, the religious right to they're, – they're doubling down on that group of people and they're gerrymandering as best they can to give those people as much say as possible. But that group is the, 
is a shrinking group. The the youth are are vacating the church faster than they ever have in this country. The non-believers and the others are soon to be the majority in this country. I, I, it really is. They're doubling down on a smaller and smaller, a, 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 re, a reducing and a shrinking group. So what? there's got to be a tipping point eventually where the religious right in this country either will become like a, um, a minority that it has gobbled up enough power to essentially restructure the de- democratic system we have and maintain power through spite and will, or they will be left behind. Hopefully they don't do too much damage on their way out. Um, but I, I really don't know what's going to happen here as far as just waiting for them to go away, like w- trying to keep the country together and waiting for the the uh, the, sex, the sexagenarians in Congress to simply retire. That 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 is my current. Keep everything together as best I can, and just wait for all the old guys to to quit. That that's the best thing. That's the best thing I can think of at the moment. And this Jeff Sessions thing here, like this guy has been around for so long, and I have a hard time believing that the younger the younger uh, voters in this country are gonna support guys like this in the future are going to support guys like Mike Pence who would be completely and totally fine with making gay bathroom bills and trans bathroom bills and, and letting companies discriminate based on religious uh, requirements. Like (laughs) I don't see how that that's going to be like a large group of people in the future, at least in around this country. So like, it's it's eerie the uh, the parallels that we're getting from Jeff Sessions and this religious liberty task force, and we know what they really want. It's code. This is code talk here. This is, this isn't religious liberty. This is we want our authoritarian um, rights back. And I I, I just I I <laughs> oh, this entire episode has been me just shaking my head in exasperation. And I don't disagree with you, Hannah. I mean, look, man. We're at, we're at a point in history where if we don't start seeing change, you and I are going to be too old to celebrate the new government. We're going to be the ones in hiding. We're going to be the ones in Wolfenstein with the guns jumping out <laughs> and blowing metal <laughs> metal robots up. We're going to be the ones saying, no more. Fuck you. We're- the GOP left, and all we have is Nazis. And I guess uh, maybe and, uh, this extreme. I don't know. Maybe am I being extreme oh, here? Uh, no, everyone will have plastic guns, and <laughs> <laughs> and we'll all have three bullets, and then we'll just throw them at each other when they all break down. <laughs> exactly. <That's- laughs> and, and you know, it's kind of funny because as as we close the episode out, you know, I mean, it's it, it, there is so much change that can happen, and I want to leave on a positive note because. And maybe I'll, I'll get a lot of crap for this in the long run, but we talk about having to have conversations, having to change people, having to do all these different things. And I've been working on my family for many years. And I'll be honest, I'm, I, I would like to cry right now because it's really hard to live in a family that doesn't support the moral standings you do, but claims Christianity as their moral foundings. And it's hard to watch them disassociate what they believe in, especially the New Testament, with how they vote, how, how they how they treat others. But I can I can tell you that as long as long as I live, I will continue to try and change people's minds. I don't I'll be eighty. I'll be that guy in the nursing home with a bottle of scotch and a big fucking joint, you know, saying, Hey, you should you, you should stop voting GOP, you should vote for the Democrat. Hey, you should stop voting Democrat, you should vote for the socialist. But I can tell you that in my family I may not have made a difference. But I can tell you I've challenged opinions, I've challenged ideas, I've challenged viewpoints. There is people in my family that are now saying, Hey, don't tell anyone, but maybe it's better to not vote for the GOP. Maybe it's better to take the deal con. Maybe it's better to vote for at least the subpar Democratic standard. And I'm going to tell you that that's a win. The Libertarians are going to be on the ticket this this ballot season. I don't know if they're going to be on too much for the primaries. They had a debate. They they, they are going to be on the primaries, and and I'm supportive of that. 
that's a step in the right direction. I'll never yeah. vote for a libertarian. I'll just be <laughs> honest. With you. I'll vote GOP before I vote libertarian. I'm uh, sorry. G- G- libertarians have less morals, in my opinion, than GOP people do. But go ahead and vote. Like, you, like to, you like to say that you're like, you got that anarchist streak in you? I do. I like that. But <laughs> I don't feel libertarians are anarchists. I feel well, they are the opposite GOP of that. is. Yeah, no. I don't know about that. But all I'm trying to say is when we get down to brass tacks and all we're here for is trying to make a difference, I can at least say that I want to do my part. Do you. It doesn't mean you got to speak out, that you have to ruin your families, that you got to do all these other things, but go out and vote. All I can say is the sooner we go out and vote, the sooner we change the Democratic Party and either split it and create another party that we can understand or you know succumb to or we're going to move the democratic party farther left and 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 and, and the, this hostile takeover it's i don't know what else to say but all i can say is the sooner we do it the better off we're going to be and i don't know all i can see is a better future thank you all Have a great night, and we'll see you next week with another amazing Cellar Door Skeptics. You've been listening to a presentation of Cellar Door Skeptics. Check us out on Spreaker. CellarDoorSkeptics.com